Thank you, choir. So we have this Sunday and next Sunday before we start the season of Lent, which prepares us for Easter, the 40 days leading up to Easter, and typically within that we focus our teaching on repentance, and that's kind of the theme for a handful of weeks, but since we got the 4th and the 11th, and uh, we have the baptism today, I kind of thought it'd be perfect if for today we focus our efforts and our conversation around baptism, the theology of baptism, and what happens, and answer some, some pretty common questions about baptism, and then next week we'll do the same thing around communion. So typically this is our communion Sunday, but we're going to focus on baptism for this Sunday, and then we'll have communion together next Sunday, um, and focus our conversation around communion. Uh, but I, kind of doing some, some quick Converse, conversing with, with folks who, who know the history of our church. Um, we've, our, this church has practiced uh, full immersion in terms of baptism before, but as far as we've known from people that really know our church, the history of our church, that's the first time it's ever been done in this building. And so that's something that's worth celebrating and pretty cool thing to be a part of um, for sure, and we're thankful for that. But I kind of knew with that, with that being a little bit different, that we might, it might spur up, uh, stir up some, some questions within us, whether they're conscious or subconscious questions. And so focusing our conversation around baptism today seemed appropriate. It'll be a little bit style, a little bit different style of a sermon, a little bit more teachy, a little bit more sort of classroom feel than, than maybe traditional sermon. Um, but I, I think that this is so interesting. And, and the sacraments, baptism and communion specifically, are major reasons why I became a pastor. I, I believe in, in their power. I believe in God's grace shared with us through them so greatly that that's one of the reasons I do what I do. And so as we talk about these things in the next two weeks, we can leave that as the backdrop of of wondering and pondering as we practice these things, we recognize a baby or a person being baptized, and we recognize it as a ritual, and we come forward to, to receive the cup and to receive the body of Christ, and yet oftentimes we don't reflect on it, um, maybe as often as we should. And that's one of the reasons that I, for, for, our, uh, for baptisms and for communion, that I will use our, what we call our liturgy out of our hymnal. The reason for that is because it teaches what happens when we are, 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 are practicing a baptism or communion. Not exhaustively at all, um, but certainly more than if we just say a brief prayer over it and then we, we pass out some bread and some juice. Um, and we do the same thing for baptism. And what's, what's important to remember about these acts of baptism and communion, we recognize them as two what we would call sacrament. They're the two sacraments that we recognize in the Protestant church because they are the two that are commanded by Jesus. Of course, they're not the only two commandments of Jesus, but they are on, they're the only two commandments of Jesus that involve doing something based on a physical ritual mean, where Jesus says, do this. You remember that from taking communion, right? Do this in remembrance of me. And we have the same command from Jesus that says, go into all the nations and baptize them. And so this is why we elevate these. The Catholic Church recognizes, I believe, seven uh, sacraments. We don't re recognize them, and yet we also can see through um, things. We practice confirmation here. We just don't recognize it as a sacrament. We don't uphold it as, as the Holy of Holies. We practice confession, although a little bit different. We still elevate that as a practice within our church. It's not necessarily um, sacramental. But a sacrament means it is something that we can touch, it is something that we can see, it is something that we can do in which God's grace is present in a unique and a special way. It is an outward sign of something that God is doing on the inside. But it's important to remember that these are not just signs. They're not mere symbols of reflection. God is at work through them in a unique and a powerful way based on God's promise that we're going to talk about a little bit together. So the question then is, is so what is baptism? And why do we do it? Why do we practice this? And the, the understanding of, of baptism from the church has grown over time. But we see baptism present among God's people from the very beginning. We look back to Jesus, first and foremost. We see Jesus being baptized, which we'll read about in a minute, and then Jesus instructing the early church to baptize as many people as they possibly can. But we can actually trace the roots of back to baptism all the way back to the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, what they would do um, as, as Hebrew people is they would have ritual baths that they would get into that they would step into and cleanse themselves of their sin. They would cleanse themselves of their sin, or we might be familiar with some things that they weren't supposed to be around or weren't supposed to touch that would make them unclean. They would get into a ritual bath to cleanse themselves from this as well, and a sort of baptism 
Um, and so we can see the same ritual of this cleansing happening all the way back from the Old Testament. And for the people of the Old Testament, it wasn't merely just a symbolic practice of the cleansing. It was an actual cleansing that was happening, that God did something unique through those waters for them. And then we see Jesus arrive on the scene. And Jesus, this is kind of what Jesus does. Jesus takes something old and something familiar, and he transforms it into something new. He takes something old and something familiar, and he turns it into something entirely new. And so let's look at Jesus' baptism from Matthew chapter 3. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to, to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. So John, taking the old framework of baptism, recognizes baptism as a cleansing of sin. And Jesus comes to John looking to be baptized, and John says, what do you have to be baptized for? You should be the one that baptizes me. But Jesus does something unique here. He shows us that, yes, baptism is about the forgiveness of sin, but baptism is about so much more than that. Jesus gives us the example, but then when Jesus is actually baptized, we see something else happening. And so let's check that out together. Let's keep reading. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So there's two different happenings here at the baptism of Jesus. The first is this. Jesus is pulled up out of the waters of baptism, and it says the heavens open up and the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus. Through baptism, we have this outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the baptized. Yes, the presence of God is always with us. This is Jesus, Emmanuel, God in human flesh. The presence of God is there, and yet God is still doing something different and unique through this baptism. And so in Jesus, the actual presence of God who comes to live and dwell with us that we might see God in a new way, that God might be closer than ever. Through baptism, Jesus declares, you know what? God can get even closer. And God has drawn ever closer through baptism. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit, God is closer than ever. And through baptism, God's transformative presence is shared with us in a new way through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But that's not all that we see happening here. We see the cool scene of, of the dove descending upon Jesus, and then something else happens. The voice of God is sounded and heard from in the story, and the voice of God declares, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And of course, we recognize this is Jesus, the Son of God, from the very beginning. God is not saying anything that isn't already known. We can think about it this way. This is an official public adoption of Jesus as God's Son through baptism. God's love for Jesus and recognition of him didn't start at his baptism, but this is his official adoption of Jesus in human flesh into the family of God. And as this is a form of adoption, this is why baptism for us is not a solemn act. It's not an individual vow. It's not a personal decision. It is a covenant, as we mentioned, between three parties, the person being baptized, the church, and God. Because once we are baptized and adopted into the family of God— the family of God better be a part of that process, and the family of God is here, praise be to God. But once we are baptized and brought into the family of God, we are no longer me, we are no longer I, but we are we, and we become us. This becomes our identity. When we are baptized, God looks at us and publicly declares, this child is mine, you are mine, and there's nothing you or anybody else in the world can ever do about it. 
ever. When we baptize one another in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we are marked as a child of God. But when Jesus tells us to go into the world and baptize one another, he immediately follows it up with a statement of instructing one another so that we all may live as people who resemble children of God through their baptisms. And we need one another to instruct one another, to hold one another accountable, to help one another grow. And this is what it means to be adopted into this family of God. And so through baptism, we have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We have initiation into adoption into the family of God. But this is only possible to be recognized as children of God, to be marked as children of God, to receive an outpouring of the presence of God within us. This is still only possible through the forgiveness of sins. If you and I are broken people that are not forgiven for our sins, then the Spirit of God cannot dwell within us. It is only possible if we are forgiven people. So in baptism, forgiveness of sins is still part of the equation here. Because sin separates and must be wiped away to have the presence of God and to receive adoption. And we see that through the early church, they continued on this motif that baptism still is a part of the forgiveness of sins. In the early church, Peter would go around telling people, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism and the forgiveness of sins are still tied, innately tied together, because that's what's happening. But this isn't a one-time thing. This isn't a one-time washing away of sins, because if you're anything like me, I would need to get in that every single day, every single hour. If it were merely washing away my past sins, but that's not what's happening at baptism. In fact, the early church uh, would often practice. Uh, this was for a longer period of time and, and widely practiced. They would not baptize until you were on your deathbed, or they would baptize you multiple times, but then they would baptize you on your deathbed. And the thought being, if baptism is, a, is merely a washing away of sins, well then we, 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 we can't afford it. It's got to be right at the last second if we want to get to heaven. And so they would baptize you right before you die. So that way, when you died, your sins would be washed away, and the thought then would be that you get to heaven. Um, but this isn't a one-time promise. This isn't a covering of the past. This is an eternal promise from God. For, for yesterday, for today, and for tomorrow. Because baptism doesn't just cover our sin of the past, but of, of all of our future sins as well. This is how the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 6. Don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus? That we were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You see, if we think about baptism as this thing we have to do over and over and over again to wash away our sins, the question then is, Jesus died just the once, right? Jesus rose just the once, and it covers. And Paul says that in baptism, we are brought into the waters of death with Christ. We die the death of Christ and raise into the resurrection of Christ through our baptism. Covering yesterday, today, and eternity through God's promise. Because in, in, in the Hebrew Bible, um, the Hebrew people saw water as, as a symbol for death and chaos. You can probably imagine that if you think about it. Think about looking out into the ocean or into any body of water, especially when it's dark. The water is not livable like the land is. You can't, you can't inhabit it. You can't inhabit it. Um, and it is chaos. You can't see the bottom. It moves, and we all recognize water's power to take any one of us. And so they saw waters as death. And this is why when we see Jesus walking on water or Jesus calming the storm, it's especially shocking to the people of Israel because th this man has power over death itself. 
And so this, this symbolism continues that in baptism, by entering the water, either, either by being dunked or, or, or sprinkled or poured or however we do it, we enter death and are raised to life, eternal life, here and now, already, by God's grace present with us. And this is all why, in, in, in the United Methodist Church, that we, we don't practice rebaptism. We believe that God is a part of this process. This is a promise of God that does not go bad, that does not expire, and is not contingent upon my behavior. So we baptize once because the promise of God is there. And why, if you come from a Catholic background or Lutheran background or Baptist background, wherever you came from, we honor and recognize those baptisms as well because God was there and God was a part of it and the promise is still the same regardless of what the logo is. This work is not about something that an individual has done, about what a child has done, about what an adult has done, about what somebody's parents have done. This is about the work of Jesus Christ and the promise of God for all people that God does all the saving God's self. So baptism is an outward sign of the work that God has done and is doing on the inside of us by which we experience this rite of initiation, this adoption into the family of God. We receive the forgiveness of sins and we experience the outpouring of God's presence, the Holy Spirit, in a new way. And through the promise of God and through baptism, this is true no matter what we go through in life. In baptism, we are recognized God sees us and says, you are mine. You are my child. And even if we choose not to be recognized as God's child, God says, you are mine. You are my child. No matter how far we think we can go, in our baptism, God says, I'm close. And this is why the Methodist Church practices the baptism of infants, because it's not about what anybody has done. It's about the work that God is doing and the promise that God offers every single one of us. So I, now, now we'll kind of move into, we talked about what is baptism, what happens, and now there's a couple of common questions that I think we can, we can get to. And the two most common are this. Do we baptize babies and why? And the second is, how much water do you have to use? Okay. And I've seen, um, I've seen a, a, a picture going around the internet, if you want to throw it on the screen, that has donuts. And one of them is a Baptist donut and the other is a Methodist donut because the one is dunked and the other is sprinkled. <laughs> um, but in the Methodist church, the one on the left would work as a Methodist and the one on the right would work as Methodist. But in the Baptist church, the one on the right would not work, but the one on the left um, would work. And so we're going to talk about these two questions. What about infant baptism, and, and how much water are we supposed to use? Um, I think it's interesting, in, in, our, in our Western context in America, it, sometimes it seems that the infant baptism is somewhat of a minority. It seems like a strange opinion, but would you be shocked to hear that 70% of global Christians affirm infant baptism? 70%. Now, the majority is not always with the will of God, but I think historically, we can recognize that 70% of global Christians and traditions affirm infant baptism. That looks like this. The Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, of course, the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Lutheran Church, the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church, and more, all recognize infant baptism. But I think because of our Western context that tends to be very Baptist, we see that as the minority, but when we look at the entire globe, it is the absolute majority. And there are many ways to explain why, why we baptize infants. I, I talked about one um, a second ago. And ultimately, what we can say is that bottom line, baptism is not about a decision a person has made. We are incapable of making that decision ourselves. It is only by God's grace. Do we have free will? Yes, we do. We can choose. But it is only by God's grace that our heart is open to receive the message of Jesus, to receive the love of of God. It is only by God's grace. And so then through baptism, it is not about a decision that we have made or something we have done, but a recognition of what God has done all along and what God always promises to do. 
that God shares his grace with us, pouring it upon us time after time, and that it's never taken away. There is nothing we can do to earn it. God gives it to us no matter what. Think about it this way. Jesus died for you and for me long before we could ever say yes. Long before we could ever say yes. Jesus rose from the grave before you or I could possibly ponder its theological significance to receive it for ourselves. God did that for you for all time before we could ever respond to it. And so through baptism, we say that God says yes to you before you could ever possibly say yes to God. That through Sierra's baptism today, God has been saying yes to her all along, and today we recognize it. God doesn't withhold his grace from us contingent upon our saying yes. God's grace is given because that's who God is. That's what God does. And we recognize that through infant baptism as well. And sometimes it's said that that there's not a lot of solid biblical backing for infant baptism. And I think if if you want to talk about, um, you know, specific examples, it's correct to say that there is no single instance where the, the name of an infant is offered being baptized and only the infant being baptized. That's true. That's not in the Bible. But... In the Bible, what we see happen on multiple, multiple, multiple occasions in the early church is that the head of the household, in the case of somebody named Lydia, this happened in the book of Acts, and it happened to a jailer as well, that Paul baptized both of them, and the scripture says that then Paul went to these people's houses and baptized the entire household, is the language. And the entire household in the biblical, in biblical and Hebrew culture would have been multiple, multiple, multiple generations in the same household. And especially in the case of Lydia, who's thought to be as a single mother, this would have likely included infants or certainly likely included people who didn't necessarily have the capacity to understand why they were being baptized. And and, in addition to that, in, in addition to baptizing household, the Apostle Paul also makes an interesting connection between the Jewish ritual of circumcision and baptism. Uh, And we'll talk about circumcision in a minute, but this is what he says. You're excited, aren't you? You didn't know you were going to talk about circumcision at church today. Paul says, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So according to Jewish tradition and Jewish rite and ritual, on the eighth day, Obviously, male babies would be taken, and they would be circumcised. And through their circumcision, this was a marking of that child as belonging to the family of Abraham. Belonging to the family then of God. Uh, Through their circumcision, adopted into this family. At eight days old, this child has had no bar mitzvah, has had no recognition of this faith for themselves. It is the faith of the parent, the faith of the father that is counted as righteousness to this child and then marked as a part of the family of God. And Paul makes a connection between this ritual and the ritual of baptism. For us, in the Jewish faith, they say the faith of the father is counted as righteousness toward the child. And when we baptize an infant, the parent, the guardian, the representative comes up, they declare their faith, and they declare their intention to raise this child in that faith. And we baptize the child, and we recognize that for all of us in baptism, it is the faith of our Father, our Trinitarian Father, that has interceded for us, that we might be counted as righteousness despite our sinfulness. And this is why the Methodist Church baptizes anyone at any age. So then the second question is, how much water are we supposed to use? Right? Do we dunk or do we sprinkle? 
Uh, there's an early church document called the Didache. We, tr- we trace it to like the, the late first century, early second century, I think, typically. And this document was an, uh, an early form of church doctrine. It wasn't just theology, but it was also structure and, and how to go about organizing the church and how to go about um, conducting the ministry of Jesus. And in the Didache, it talks about how if you can, use, use living water. So use a stream or use a, an ocean or use a lake or use something that's alive in baptism if you can. And it says, if you can't use that, then whatever you got is fine. And it says, well, you should use cold water. You're welcome, Sierra. Um, I guess thinking that you go down in the cold water, and I guess you want to come back up as soon as you can, and I guess it shakes the demons out of you, I don't know. Um, but it said use cold water, but it said if you don't want to use cold water, you can use warm water. And it said if you, well, if you, uh, if, if you can, you know, Fully immerse yourself, but if you can't do that, then a, pour, a pouring on the head three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is permissible. And so this is why to this day when we baptized infants, and you heard me say it when we obviously didn't force her to go down underwater three times, but we baptized her in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And when we baptize, and when we baptize infants, we take three scoops in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we have evidence from the early church that using a scoop or a pouring as an alternative method of baptism was acceptable from an early church document as early as the first century. It doesn't get much earlier than that as far as the church goes. But secondly and more importantly is that water is only the sign. It's not, that the, it's not that what we do is only a sign, but the water itself is only a sign. We said, remember, that baptism is, is a sign act, meaning, yes, it is a sign, but there's actually an action that's happening. The water doesn't provide the action. The grace of God provides the action. And so if we say we have to use X amount of water for our baptism to count, then we're saying, sure, God needs X amount of water to do the deed. We give more power to the medium than the provider if we say it has to be done in this certain way. And and friends, we all know the provider is more powerful than the medium. As powerful as water is, it gives us life. It sustains life. It has the power to take life. The provider of the act is more powerful than the medium of the sign. And so, whether we're baptized as an infant, as we're baptized as a kid, as an adult, whether we're, we're dunked or whether we're sprinkled, baptism is powerful. Baptism is a powerful, life-changing experience because Jesus is there. The Holy Spirit is poured upon us in a new way. God's grace is given to us in a unique way. By God's promise, this happens and is sustained forever. Through baptism, God permanently declares, you are mine. And through God's grace shared with us, through our baptism and in our life, we start to become people who resemble someone being worthy of being called a child of God. We might start to live into what God has identified us as in our baptism. Someone who looks like a child of God, even though we are counted as one whether we live that way or not. And we want to invite you to to be part of this. Um, If you you were baptized um, as an infant, if you were baptized as an adult, we want to remember our our baptisms uh, today. And if you're an infant and you're like, remember my baptism, how am I supposed to remember it? It's not a photographic remembrance. It's a reflection and a recognition of the work that God has done within us, a reflection on the grace moving within us that was offered to us by God through our baptism. And so Pastor Craig and I are going to meet you here at these aisles just here. You can come forward and see us and remember our baptism. Come to the kneeler if you'd like to pray. Um, We will just have a little bit of water, and we can put the sign of a cross on your forehead, on your hand, or whatever it is that you'd like to do. Um, And you can come to the kneeler if that's something that you'd like to do. You can head back to your seat if that works best for you. Um, If you haven't been baptized, or if you're not sure, a couple of options. We've got the the gold connect cards around you somewhere. Put a note on that and put it in the offering box, or come come hand it to me when you come up. Um, You're also more than than, uh, welcome to come talk to me or Pastor Craig about becoming baptized, if that's something you'd like to do. If you're not sure, 
Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we might not be sure. But if you're not sure, come talk to, about, uh, talk to us about that as well. Um, and so let's say a quick prayer over our time of remembrance, and then everybody um, who would like to come remember our baptisms together. God, thank you for the power of baptism. That through these physical means, these physical means that you use, you make us new, you give us your grace. And so, God, may we then, as baptized people, become physical means of your grace for the world around us, be tangible ways that people experience your grace and your love. And so as we, we remember our baptisms, remind us that you are with us, that we are your child, that we are forgiven, and we are empowered. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.